are listening to episode 2 of the Morb Extend. What's the crack? This is Phil Spillan. Welcome back to the Morbeg's Den. This is episode two. We have a show for you all. I've learned new things on this journey of this podcast. New things and I keep learning new things because this is, this is, this is um, a new venture for me. And um, I'm looking forward to learning so much about running a show like this and getting in contact with interesting human beings to, to bring to you and bring bring you their inspiration and bring you their art and it has been very challenging but I managed to pull together episode two especially for my audience and I hope you're going to enjoy the the show I got set up I can't wait but first before we introduce our guest and introduce our musician we're going to talk about a little bit of inspiration and today's inspiration is um from the Japanese writer Hayoko Murakami. Have you heard of him? He's from Kyoto, Japan, and he was born in 1949. He's a very, very interesting, magical, magical surrealist writer. Very, very interesting person. He can pull anything out of the mundane, anything, anything strange out of the simple. And I think I've learned a lot about writing from reading his books. I've read One Q84 Trilogy, and I've also read Colourless. I read a little bit of The Wind-Up Chronicles, and I've also did The Hard-Boiled Wonderland. And these books had a huge influence on my writing and my choice of scenes and how I write my characters because Murakami is very good at the simple things. He has big characters but they move in very simple, simple ways and they have great imaginations and big thoughts. And I think it and I never seen that style being done by other by other writers. It's very unique. Recently I got a book by him called Novelist as a Vocation and it's a memoir or it's how he sits down and writes his novels. How he sits down, what's his methods, what's his philosophy and what's his tactics, you could say. And I'm going to read a section of it. And this was doing, done in one take, so hopefully I've done a good job. And then we go over to our guest, who's Elisa Sapadin. I can't wait to introduce you to her. But first, let's dive into this book. See how can I pull off a little audiobook for you. Sit back, enjoy, and listen. So this is like page 83. So what should I write about? Two principles guided me. The first was to omit all explanations. Instead, I would toss a variety of fragments, episodes, images, scenes, and phrases into a container called a novel and then try to join them together in a three-dimensional way. Second, I would try to make these connections in a space set entirely apart from conventional logic and cliches. And that is my basic scheme. More than anything else, music helped move the process forward. I wrote as if I were performing a piece of music, jazz, and as my inspiration. As you know, the most important aspect of jazz is performance and rhythm. You have to sustain a solid rhythm from start to finish. When you fail, people stop listening. The next most important element is the chords or the harmony. Beautiful chords, muddy chords, secondary chords, chords with 
tunic removal, Bob Powell cords, Herbie Hancock's cords. There are so many kinds. Though everyone is using a piano with the same 88 keys, the sound varies to an amazing degree depending on who's playing. This says something important about novel writing as well. The possibilities are limitless, or vir virtually limitless. Even if we use the same limited material, the fact that the piano has only 88 keys hardly means that nothing new can be done with it. Finally, there's a matter of free improvisation, which lies at the root of jazz music. Once the rhythm, the chord, the progression have been established, the musician is able to weave notes freely into a composition. Now, I can't play in a musical instrument, or at least I can't play one well enough to expect people to listen to me. Yet I have a strong desire to perform music from beginning and therefore my intention was to write as if I were playing an instrument. I still feel like that today. I sit, tapping away on the keyboard, searching for the right rhythm, the most suitable chords and tunes. And this is and has always been the most important element of my literature. And that was from Murakami's book, Novelists as a Vocation. And it's, that's very, very beautiful to compare writing literature to trying to compose or do some jazz. And um, Elisa, my guest here today, is a huge, huge Murakami fan. And I uh, say she has a lot more to say about Murakami than I do. And I wonder, because I know she hasn't read this book, although, although I believe she hasn't, um, Elisa, what do you think of that? Say hello to everyone. Hello, <laughs> my name is Elisa. Um, yeah. How are you doing? Great. Yeah. What do you think <laughs> yeah. of that? Did you did you enjoy that? You were eating your sandwich while I was reading you a book, which <laughs> which I never did. I never read a book while someone else was eating before. How did I do? <laughs> did you enjoy it? Did I did I read did I read your nice little lunch story? <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, food uh, is a recurrent uh, image in Murakami's books as well. So He does talk about characters making breakfast and lunch. And, and what they eat. Yeah. I remember when I was in high school with a few friends of mine, we did this uh, thing called literary dinners. So each of us would cook something um, found from a novel. Mm -hmm. And I I actually made uh, a whole meal that Murakami had described, I think, in Norwegian wood. Oh, sweet. I haven't yeah. read that one yet. Mm. That's so cool. I do uh, value that for Murakami a lot because he talks about the little things. You know, like a lot of books now, they have big characters. Like they can be psychopaths or crazies or heroes, superheroes. And even though those characters are great and they're very enjoyable, very entertaining and great escapism, we don't know what it's like to be those people half the time. But it's always cool to actually wonder, what do those characters eat for breakfast? Mm -hmm. When do they go to the bathroom? Yeah. When do they feel turned on? <laughs> and Murakami, in fairness, talks about those little things. Um, and that's why I really, really like his writing. What do you think of that piece, the 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 jazz? There's definitely a a constant rhythm, um, a constant rhythm to his narration, and I mean he. Wait, are we talking about Murakami's books or writing in general? <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I think it works uh, in writing. I think it works in life. <laughs> Probably as with a as with a lot of things. I know that actually that extract you read reminded me of another, um, another book of his, in which he says, you know, that you always have to follow the rhythm, and if it's time to go up, you have to find the highest tower or something like that. Oh wow! And stand on top of the highest tower. If it is time to go um, down or low, you have to, um, you know go into the deepest well you can find and go really low and if it's time to do nothing you have to sit still and absolutely do nothing and I think it's about following 
the rhythm and like going where it does take you um on a more concrete level i think when you write um you do need a sustained energy um and otherwise it will be kind of stagnant then again if it is time for it to be stagnant and have a lot of description that's probably also okay but i guess um I don't know what, th- what I'm saying that's anymore. Beautifully put. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. And I, I, I know you kind of ran, you felt like you ran out of words, but that's very beautiful. You said a lot there. Mm-hmm. I think that's from, um, is that from the cuckoo, the, the metal, the metal cuckoo, something like that? Yeah, yeah, it's well, from that one. What's, what's that called? What's that got that title uh, wrong? Wind up the Wind Up Cuckoo, yeah. The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. The Wind Up Bird Chronicle, that's right. Uh, I could never get into those, not, not, uh, those, those mm-hmm. books, but uh, I did read colorless uh tosuke tosuke takamono something like that um colorless is the main title anyway and uh excuse my japanese and 1q84 which i loved i I loved that trilogy it it really had a significant influence on my own writing and i think murakami's pretty good at the small mundane things and definitely going to consider my rhythm and maybe think I, I like the way he's tap tap tapping on the keyboard or whatever that's very that's very descriptive yeah. and the concept of improvisation is also very beneficial to writing to use i think because many times writers make very detailed plans of what they're going to mm. talk about but that takes a bit of the a bit of the fun out of it um it does and he and he kind of talks about not to think so much don't worry about the cliches or worry about the um what you have in mind and plan just make episodes make uh, make ideas and just put them on the page yeah do you think Murakami influences your own writing oh yeah I think especially um, for you know the first the first parts you read there I was thinking of the first point especially um, I think a lot of my writing is trying to get a lot of things out of my head that are living in my head um be it characters or situations or you know feelings or memories and uh kind of get them out and get them all on the page and link them together i think especially with writing prose um that really resonates with me um what about with you does every writer do that most definitely uh i i come up with a lot of things Sometimes when I get very <laughs> upset <laughs> on going to a really, really hard day, like, uh, I don't know, if I go, <laughs> if I get rejected, for instance, I'm kind of like broken down outside, but inside I'm going, this will make great writing material. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's incredible. Sometimes I, 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 I'm annoyed with it, but sometimes, but I think I love it as well, where something traumatic is happening, but I'm turning everything around me back into description. Mm. And it's so such weird then I don't know is it normal or it's some skill I've practiced subconsciously in the back of my head or maybe it's just something that all writers have going on in their heads <laughs> do, do do you listeners suffer from that <laughs> or, or, or have that gift do yeah. you have that Elisa where you just look around you not even in a in a in a negative situation but say a positive situ- situation and you just translate what you see back into words or back into something artsy do you look at something kind of go i want to make that into a painting or i i I can i could put this to words and be exactly what i see or how i feel about it yes yes absolutely in fact i um just today i was on one of my driving classes um one of the first ones so i'm still pretty bad but we went on a main road uh it's kind of like a tragic comedy i would say <laughs> the whole uh, <laughs> me trying to drive on a main road my driving instructor is like sweating and i am sweating and <laughs> and all the time i'm thinking oh this is going to be such a good poem like his expressions would just make a beautiful poem if i were to describe like my actions and his expressions and the the way this poor guy looks at me while I'm rambling on and then I started laughing in the middle of it <laughs> and I was like what's up 
and I'm saying, oh, sorry, there's like so many things go around in my head while I'm trying to drive and focus. Like I'm, I have these stories in my head, <laughs> and he looked at me like, just drive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I think a lot of poems were in my head while I was trying. You do see a lot while you're driving, a lot, and you can't really stop and stare. <laughs> but you so, you so want to. Yeah, and it was more about how. I was feeling and how he was feeling um and uh, yeah it's that fun interaction that that would make a good story when did you start writing lisa mm, i think i was about 11 um when i was writing my first poems <coughs> and then i started writing a book when i was 13. oh wow what sort of book a fantasy story always um, <laughs> always and um i don't know would you like me to tell you about it if whatever's comfortable yeah please please tell us i, I was just saying always like you know fantasy is always the go-to for kids isn't it yeah tell us tell us about tell us about the story what what, what give us give us a lovely gist of your your fantasy story from 11 11 year old lisa and <laughs> the story is 13 um excuse me yeah yeah I um a princess gets gets locked up in a tower. The tower is covered in mirrors and all of her reflections are talking to her. Um this goes on in the castle with um the princess has a absentee father, the king, very busy with, you know, governing um his reign. And then we have a parallel plot that goes around outside of the castle grounds in a city nearby with a girl who gets chosen by magic to save the princess. Cool, cool. What a beautiful, beautiful imagination. And let's hear some of your poems, Elisa. Let's see what your style of writing is right now. I'm sure we'd love to hear it. Okay. Um, the first poem I want to read is called um, Kore, which is um, Persephone's maiden name. And um, the other another reference that I have in the poem is uh, Mete. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing them in the right ancient Greek pronunciation, but um, uh, Mete being... Uh, another name of Demeter so it's a um, bit of a retelling of the story of uh, Persephone before she became Persephone um, Kore would have been the name that uh, her mother would have called her with and Meter is the name that uh, she would have called her mother with so it's a oh, mother-daughter story so Meter means mother hmm Mieta yes. means mother, and this is from the Greek mythology, Persephone. Yes. Perfect. Um, but of course, since becoming a mother, I've been uh, preoccupied with this, <laughs> the mother-daughter relationship. Um, and I think myths, of course, provide us with endless inspiration. They do, don't they? They do. And so we can twist them and turn them to whatever we want. Mm -hmm. looking forward to hearing this far away yes well i will need you right by my side phil to read the second voice oh my yeah okay you're gonna be my mom can i call you mom that's that's very <laughs> surreal we just finished murakami there right now so and murakami raised a lot about these sort of <laughs> sure sure if it's a prose and poetic sense and it's and, and it's for you of course i will <laughs> daughter thank you <laughs> Mother, the pomegranates are filling up with seeds, an unrelenting tide of plenty, a cornucopia of jewels. I press my fingers into the fruit and crack it and breathe into its flesh. Six hundred stories and none, not one of them was told by you. I play with the surface of the pomegranate skin, bruises and knots, a map of time. The fruit is a cave I inhabited only in my dreams. 600 dreams and none, not one was dreamt by you. I dreamt you, 
into this world. I dreamt you out of my dreams. I shall tune my piano fingers to the harp. I shall modulate my timbre into honey. I shall walk over hills with leather feet and fly through the tunnels underground. I dreamt you into this world. I dreamt you out of my dreams. Core. Perhaps it's every daughter's curse to understand her mother and every daughter's duty to disavow her roots. As if you were not fruit. As if you were not fruit. Meter, the comet that causes people to head home and me to become a vagrant meteor. I face the open pomegranate, a mouth to a mouth, teeth set to teeth, six hundred secrets spilling out, and none, not one of them was told by you. The fruit is a cave I enter willingly, walls dark with delight, braiding my stories, weaving my dreams, spinning my secrets. That is so, so cool. I feel like I was part of that story now. What's the imagery with the 600, the 600 stories and the 600 seeds? What's what's that about? Oh, um, 600, uh, they say that pomegranates around 600 seeds. I think 613. Wow. But I think like that's more of a legend. I think most of them have around 600. But you made that into a metaphor or you made it into a mythology itself because that doesn't sound like that came from Greek mythology. It looks like you, you pulled that into your your poem. I kind of the question I'm kind of asking is and what I wanted to ask while I was reading it, where does the mythology stop and where does your own mythology begin? Or do you want to give us a little breakdown of your poem or or whatever's comfortable? <laughs> Well, I think it's mostly my own mythology, but I do think that the Persephone myth has been used. Uh, I'm pretty sure in other occasions to discuss um, kind of the relationship between the mother and the daughter. Of course, originally it's not about that, but um, I do think it's a uh, element of it. Uh, you know, Persephone um, kind of living a double life oh, underground yes. and overground. With uh, Hades. Yes, so with her mother waiting for her and her emerging from underground, I think what I'm talking about is that point when a daughter decides to not live in the kind of in the shade of her own mother but to look for something that's just entirely hers. And a different way of being a woman or, you know, growing up and discovering the world. That's beautiful. Like, I'm um, thinking of the legend there again. And I might say it in case our viewers don't know the legend of Persephone. And Lisa maybe might help me a bit there if I, if I do it in a very bad summary. But basically, Persephone had a curse where she had to live winter and autumn with Hades on the ground. The god, the, go- the king of the underworld. And then she had to live to spring and summer with her with her mother. And that's an explanation of why things die and things disintegrate and change. The seasons change in autumn and winter because Persephone's gone under, under, underground and her mother, her mother is Di- Dionites? Demeter. Demetra, Demetra, yeah. sorry, Demetra. Sorry, Demetra. Um... Demetra, son, the son, the goddess of the sun, I think, so the link of that, she she gets sad that her daughter is gone, and so she makes everything cold and dark and dreary for winter and autumn. And then when her daughter's back, everything comes sunny and summery again, which I think is beautiful mother and daughter imagery there for your poem. Um, but you made it your own, you made it very personal. Like that, that poem is 100% you, and I think, I think what you borrowed from the Greek myths is is very balanced. Yeah, thank you. And oh, I forgot, of course, Persephone eats from a pomegranate. Yes, what's the pomegranate? Uh, what's that pomegranate about? Some pomegranate seeds, and that's how she gets um, chained in quote marks. You know, connected to to the underworld by eating the fruit. Because then she, she can never leave. Fruit. Yes, Hades. 
so that's why I use the pomegranate. Um, but of course, I associate the underworld to just darkness, as in the the darker side of our person or of things that we have to discover ourselves. But um, yeah, Hades kind of welcomes her in, and he gives her food, and it's a pomegranate, and mm-hmm. it and it traps her in the underground. Then the underworld. Then as she can never leave, she becomes part of the underworld. Then, however, even though that's what the pomegranate is used in the legend to trap Persephone. Or not even trap, but make her belong to the underworld in some ways. You use it in a completely different way, uh, I feel. Mm. Well, I think the... <laughs> I'm very fascinated by pomegranates, <laughs> generally. Um, yeah, I was thinking, otherwise I have another poem, um, which I'm thinking about, and you'll soon realize why. Um <laughs> This poem is called uh, Waiting in a Line at the Supermarket. (laughs) Sorry, sir. I didn't mean to step on your shoe. Um, I heard a pop when I broke your personal space. There is something about supermarkets, the waste, the repetition, that makes me feel like an alien among different types of aliens. That makes me want to pop every personal space I encounter. And laughing hysterically, laughing like a child, hold on to anything, search for anything. Keep holding on and keep searching. Sorry, sir. This line we're waiting in makes me want to bury myself under a tree. I want to bury you and the fat lady with the yogurt, too. I want want to drag you down with me. I'd step on your shoe and crouch and then grab your ankle the way your nightmares go. Because what about the way that our particles have the tendency to mix with those of the earth? With those of the worms? Sorry, sir. I dropped my pomegranate so close to your shoe. I did it on purpose. I'm looking for the pop. Thank you for picking it up. And while you're at it, how dead do you think it is? How alive do you think it is? Sorry, sir, I do need to ask. Does this look like a symbol to you? Doesn't it really feel like one? Do you think that that pear is a symbol as well? What do you stand for standing there? Is this a pose? Is that a pose? Wouldn't you prefer to feel like a rose? I pay for my one pomegranate. I'm lost in my 9.45 p.m. sad line at the sad supermarket fantasies. The alien in the suit has disappeared, and with him, the fat alien with the yogurt. I flirt with thoughts of crazy. I wish I could laugh and speak in a thin little voice from the canyons, which belongs to all aliens, in a not-so-prophetic now voice that comes from the rocks and oozes like gas. Could I disappear into your belly buttons? I'm looking for the mother of all things. I'm looking for the house of symbols. Could I disappear into your belly buttons? It's hard to eat shit without having visions. Thanks. Oh, I love that poem so much. That is so good. And you know what? Relating back to Murakami there earlier, there's a certain rhythm in that poem, a certain like tap, tap, tap. Of course, you have a sound in it too, a pop which you're always conscious of. And so there's lots of sounds and rhythms going on in the supermarket, especially when you're writing in line. Um, did you, what was it like writing that poem, that process, uh, that experience of just something so mundane and making it into such a magical, surreal experience like you did in that poem? Because that's magical realism right there, man. I love it. Um, <laughs> what was it like doing that? And just tell us a little bit about that process. This poem comes from a time where I had a very hard time going into supermarkets, (laughs) as as easily understood. Um, So this was basically the voice in my head (laughs) of um, when I would be in a supermarket. It's it's not that magical to me in terms of magical realism because it's that um, those feelings were absolutely present. So I'm just... uh, putting down the voice in my head on the paper um and that's a uh, that's very cool that that that's that's a lot of talent right there um i, I that definitely makes me makes me value that poem a lot more um do you have one more to show us to show off to us yeah yeah it doesn't have a a pomegranate <laughs> does it have a pomegranate <laughs> 
Um, like I, I usually try and think of a, a name for the episodes and maybe I could call it a pomegranate. I was thinking of calling it jazz, but, but maybe pomegranate might be more suited. <laughs> um, the jazzy pomegranate. Pomegranate Blues. <gasps> pomegranate Blues. Well, now, <laughs> I like that name a lot. The Pomegranate Blues. And it's all about bluesy pomegranates, <laughs> which I would think in a little while, Rita, Rita Lynn's song is coming up there very soon. And her song is definitely Pomegranate Bluesy. Definitely, definitely full of 600, <laughs> seeds, 600, 600 keys in her piano as she plays. But... Elisa is going to do one more song, uh, one more poem, one more poem for us. And I'm really looking forward to it. So um, when you're ready there, Elisa, give us give us one more poem and uh, I, and uh, one more piece of your amazing, amazing imagination. Oh, thank you, Phil. Um, there's no pomegranates here, but um, that's all right. It's. Uh, it's about being home. I wrote it a few years ago when I was in Italy. Um, so it's got other uh, sensual stimuli in the sense of sensual in the sense of relating to the senses, smells and colors and consistencies. Um, day one, I bury my fingers in the little rocks of the car park in front of my window. I sit and smoke a cigarette, hugging my knees. I become smaller. Surely I've done this forever. I must have been doing this forever. I dig with my fingers, looking for my fingers, digging years ago. The fingers I must have left here, fingers buried under rocks, under fingers digging in the rocks. I'm still looking. Day two. I sit with you next to your dead father. You talk about your childhood and the wood of the toys you made for you and the wood of the walks in the woods. I want to spread petals on his grave, but I have no flowers. So I smoke my cigarette and follow the fall of the ash on your father's bed of wood, conscious of eternity and eternal overlapping of season and space and colors and place. Day three. I watch colors match, the color of my pajamas with that of the couch, with that of the cups and with that of the hair of my cat, with the shirt of my mother, with the calendar hanging in the kitchen, with the bed sheets and towels and jumpers and every single strange book. A whole harmony of greens and blues and oranges and reds. Galaxies of sense. Day three. I sit in the shade of your house, the shadows of your garden. Olives and juicy tomatoes. Pesto, warm bread. Wine and alcohols of herbs. Flowers on the table. Flowers in the garden. Sun in the flowers in the garden. Mosquitoes and smoke. Sweaty hands touching. Sweaty legs touching. Mouthfuls touching. Day one, two, three, four. I throw the three coins and sip rice milk with turmeric and black pepper. I might be a rich Chinese elder of the fifth century. The three coins, the coin of the past, the coin of the present and the coin of the future, I say to myself. However idiotic, routines are safe and beautiful, especially long lost ones. Three coins in the table, in the sunshine, in the perfume of rosemary. Day five. Naked and barefooted, finally. Simple as a morning on some perfect occasions of happiness-induced lack of sleep. That is so cool. It's like you drifted off to sleep back at home. The yeah. way you ended it off just like that. And that poem sounded so nostalgic. And so, like, um, it sounds like a fragment of memory. Very different from your pomegranate poems. Although, it, it sounded more like a like a painting. I know you're into painting as well, so maybe that has oh. some influence there as well. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time out and having a chat about writing, a chat about rhythm, a chat, a chat about blues, a chat about pomegranates, and a chat about fairy tales and stories, stuff like that. I'm sure there are lots of kid writer, people who want to write books for children or young adults and and want to have some piece of inspiration and want any feedback. I'm sure they got a lot about got a lot out of what you said to us there today and i really appreciate you taking the time out and having a chat about it and um and giving your poems as well your magical realism such a gift and such a such imagination thank you so much um we're going to go to rita lynn's song there now i gave a little 
teaser for it there earlier on. I'm so psyched for letting us have the permission for her for us to have her songs on the show. She's an incredible artist. So she has a few new single coming out, a new song, a new and she's doing gigs all around Cork City. Um, if you do see her poster around the place, do definitely go. I know she be she was performing on the 29th of March in Kinsale there recently. And um, she definitely will have more shows coming up. She's a, she's a growing, growing sensation here. And I'm so honoured to have her son featured on her show. And uh, I just want to mention as well that, you know, like, if you want to support her, visit her instagram visit her her website and um purchase the album if you want to support her um all her, all the rights of the music belong to her so if you want to just enjoy just just enjoy the music this pomegranate blues as we said earlier um so yeah rita lynn is going to come up next elisa thank you once again you were looking forward to hearing rita yeah very excited cool 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 this is Rita Lynn. Put a leaf, you know. 
That's the um, that's the title of the song. That's what the song is called, and uh, it's the last verse of the song. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Rita. Hope you're listening in. Giving you a huge, huge wave here from the Morbegs Den. Thank you, and thank you for everyone that tuned in today. I hope you got six hundred ideas now floating around in your imagination right now. 600 ideas like like a pomegranate <laughs> and I hope you're tap tap tapping away with rhythmic with rhythmic wonders and I hope we set you free to write music and sounds and poems and prose off you go <laughs> um, my, my imagination has definitely gone crazy right now I want to Say a big thank you also to Elisa for joining us here on the show. And um, I'm so psyched that episode two went so well. The next episode of the Morbex Den will be the 31st of May. So every two months. So the next one will be the, the 31st of May, the last Friday of May. And we will have announcements for the guests very soon. If you have any feedback... Or if you want to take part in a future show, just email morebegs.den.email at gmail.com. And that should be in the description of, of the show. So keep a lookout for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hope you have a wonderful day, wonderful evening, wonderful sleep, wonderful dreams, wonderful writing. <laughs>